Hello, this is Dr. Glassbrenner from George Mason University, and in this video, we will continue our discussion of the computational and data sciences by getting an overview of the concept of data. To begin our discussion of data, it would help if we can define some of our terms, because these will pop up over and over again throughout the semester. So to start, you will find that people will talk about variables when talking about data and data sets. A variable is simply a quantity, quality, or property of something that you can measure. Closely connected with this is value, and all a value is, is the state of a variable when you measure it. In addition, the value of a variable may change from measurement to measurement. And indeed, that's where the interesting findings in science come from. Observation is what connects values and variables, and it also is what relates variables to one another. This is because an observation is a set of measurements made under similar conditions, and an observation can contain several values, each of which gets associated with a different variable. So this is how you're able to measure change over time within a system, for example. When discussing different kinds of variables, you will often find that they're lumped into one of two classes either explanatory variables or response variables. If you would like to identify the explanatory variable in a pair, what you need to do is identify which of the two you suspect of affecting the other. So schematically, you would draw it as an explanatory variable possibly affecting and leading to a response variable. Why the caveat? Well, labeling variables as explanatory in response does not guarantee the relationship between the two is actually causal, even if there is an association identified between the two variables. We use these labels only to keep track of which variable we suspect affects the other. Next up, we have tabular data or rectangular data, which is the primary way that we're going to encounter data within this course. So what do we mean by this? Tabular data is a set of values, each associated with a variable and an observation. An example of tabular data is given below. What we have here is data collected on students in a data science class on a variety of variables. So we have multiple students within the class. We catalog whether or not they are male or female. We ask how many hours a night on average they get sleep. And we ask them to rank their dread of taking the course for the semester. You will find that data sets can often be expressed in this format, and you will get quite familiar with it as the semester goes on. Now, the data that we'll encounter can come in different types, and so let's review those now. First up, we have numerical data, and all this is is data that is a number, such as an integer, which by that we mean whole numbers, or a float, and by that we mean real numbers. So for some examples of numerical data, you can think of the types of measurements that come from device sensors through counting and polling people on some given set of questions, looking at the outputs of some computational simulations, and the list goes on. Next up is categorical data. Categorical data allows us to group observations into a set. Categories can be in a textual form, for example, brand names for a certain kind of product, or they can be numerical. For example, it's one way that you could label city districts. We also can have textual data. By this, we mean plain text that is too varied to be treated as a category. Some examples of this would be people's full names, the text of a full literary work, tweets, and it goes on and on. Uh, this schematic shows us that numerical and categorical data, which will be the primary forms that we will encounter in this class, actually break down into even more distinct categories. At the very top of this hierarchy, we have all kinds of variables that we can encounter. We can then subset these into numerical or categorical, but then with numerical, we actually have two groups in that. We have continuous numbers, meaning that they can be anywhere on the number line, and we can have discrete observations, meaning they can only take on very distinct values and nothing in between. On the categorical data side, we have the two categories of regular and ordinal. By regular, this is just categories that have no order encoded in them. But for ordinal, what we mean is there actually is some meaning held within the order of those categories. So for example, the days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So now let's go with an example to actually illustrate how these concepts could be observed within an actual data set. So we return to our poll of students at the beginning of a data science class, and we see that we have several variables at the header of this table. Let's see what each of them are. First up, we have the sex of the student, and this would be an example of a categorical variable. Next, we have the average number of hours they report sleeping every night, and this would be an example of a numerical data type that is also continuous. Next up, we have the time ranges that the students reported going to bed, and this is an example of a categorical variable that is also ordinal. Next, we have the number of countries that the students have visited in their lifetime, and this is an example of a numerical variable that is discrete. 
For example, it's not possible to visit 2.5 countries. You've either visited two or three. And then finally, dread can be classified as categorical and ordinal because it's an ordered ranking, but it's finite or possibly numerical. This is one of those cases where either or would work. There are two main modes of data collection you can do to produce data sets similar to the one on the previous slide. It's worth pointing out that these modes actually affect the strength of a researcher's conclusions, and so it's worth keeping in mind what they are. The first of the two modes is what's called an observational or a field study. And in these, researchers will collect data in a way that does not directly interfere with how the data arise, i.e. all they do is merely observe. This contrasts with the second mode known as experiments. In an experiment, researchers systematically control variables in order to establish causal connections. They do this by careful tuning of one parameter of an experimental apparatus. For example, by changing a single chemical component, by altering one nutrient in an organism's diet, and the examples go on. Often, when conducting an experiment, people would like to have their experiment be what's called a blind study. In a blind study, you randomly assign subjects to treatments. And this experiment can become double blind if the experimental observers themselves are also randomly assigned. The idea is that you do not want to influence either consciously or unconsciously the outcomes that you're going to observe. Within these modes of data collection, how do we actually end up with data that we can then analyze? There are several different classifications that we can consider. First up are the manual measurements. And so these are some of the oldest methods that we have at our disposal. One of the forms of manual measurements is comparison against the baseline. And examples of this include using a ruler, weighing things with a scale, or measuring time passage with a stopwatch. Another form of manual measurement is record keeping. And this would correspond to counting things, writing down behavioral notes, keeping ledgers, keeping timelines, and noting relationships between people. Yet another form is self-reporting. And so we would classify things like surveys and interviews well under this category. So the next class of measurements we have are what are called sensor measurements. And there's many different types of sensors that are out there. There are electrical sensors, temperature sensors, mechanical sensors, chemical sensors, electromagnetic ones, ones that work for navigation. Cameras and light can be turned into sensors. Uh, there can be pressure sensors. And then you can keep thinking of additional examples. The thing that unifies all of these together is that they're detecting some sort of change in the environment. It should also be noted that a lot of these sensors can be found in your cell phone and that they produce a lot of the functionality that we've all come to enjoy. Many of the benefits of using sensor-based measurements instead of manual measurements include data collection is far more automated, that is far more precise, and gives us access to properties that manual methods just will not be able to measure. The last class of data categories that we will discuss are digital artifacts. Digital artifacts are data that are generated in a digital format first. So this can be data from the internet, which includes server logs, activity on social networks, web search results, online transactions, data transmission logs, and the list can go on and on. Digital artifacts can also correspond to a corpus of digital texts. This can include digital books, articles, government documents, email, messages, and the list goes on. Finally, we have databases, and the databases can serve and contain information from several different fields and disciplines, including scientific databases, social databases, government databases, ones used by business, and on and on.